Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I thought it would be a good opportunity right now to introduce myself at last. So I'm Judith Bishop and I am the Director of Computer Science in Microsoft Research Connections. Uh, it's probably also a good opportunity to introduce Microsoft Research Connections. Uh, we are the external research, as it was called, part of Microsoft Research with a part that actively interacts with academics, that's you, most of you, and starts off and amplifies a lot of the engagements between our researchers and the, um, the work inside universities. We're going to hear more about that, I think, when our first speaker speaks. And when we have our little panel today, which is going to have four of our amazing um, top executives from Microsoft Research, I've asked them to do three things. I've asked them actually to introduce their role and responsibilities inside Microsoft uh, themselves, rather than me doing it. And I've asked them to do two things. One, to talk about two of the challenges that they see for software in the next 20 years on, and what they can see as the calls to action that us, all of us, could look to, to reduce any barriers that would enable us to achieve solutions to these challenges. Um, I keep talking about us, or you, or this group, and I thought you'd like to know just some quick statistics as to who we are. So in this room today, we have representatives from 28 countries, and actually 125 institutions, of which 25 are industrial, including some of our biggest competitors, so that's rather fun. Um, we have 215 attendees, and I understand we'll also have a few guests tonight on our boat. I hope not too many, because the boat takes 230, after which apparently it will sink. So, <laughs> but they have assured us there'll be enough life belts. Life belts. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to call on our first speaker, who is Dr. Tony Hay. Tony Hay is well known, of course, to many of you. He has a very distinguished career throughout uh, Britain, Europe, and of course, America, where he has spent the last many years. And he is Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Research Connections. Tony. Thank you, thank you very much, Judith. Uh, yes, so I'm privileged to be uh, in charge of our university collaborations, now called Microsoft Research Connections. Uh, just to, some words about my background. Uh, I went to the other place. I did my undergraduate and my PhD in Oxford, uh, which is, I, I know it's not popular here. Um, uh, and I did a PhD in theoretical physics, but actually uh, my world was changed when I did a postdoc at Caltech and I arrived uh, and I was in the same research group as Richard Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann, Nobel Prize winners, which um, you, you rapidly learn in Oxford that the world revolves a little bit around Oxford, but in Caltech you rapidly learn that uh, Europe to a first approximation doesn't exist. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So after doing uh, f physics, theoretical particle physics for 15 years, um, I switched in the mid-80s to computing. I've now been doing that for 25 years, so some of my friends almost regard me as a computer scientist after 25 years. Uh, what I started doing was parallel computing, and uh, that's one of the challenges I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and I became uh, head of department of a computer science department where we taught our students Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Java, Eclipse, Perl, Python, Ruby, open source, and not much Microsoft technology. Uh, uh, and then 
after a short stint at Dean of Engineering, I was very fortunate to be running the UK e-science program, which was a multidisciplinary program, which is an opportunity, I think, for the computer science community to actually help the world solve some of its most significant problems. And that was a very exciting period, and that was what essentially I was brought in by Craig Mundy to Microsoft uh, to do, was to start, a, 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 if you like, a science at Microsoft program. And uh, uh, then I took on uh, my old community of computer scientists as well. So that's enough background. Uh, we, we do fund projects around the world, in, in Asia, in our labs in Beijing and India. We have our Microsoft Research Connections. We have one in, in EMEA, of course, and we also have activities in Latin America as well as North America. Challenges, right, okay. So um, I'm slightly depressed uh, about the state of parallel programming. Uh, I was one of the people who wrote the first draft of the message passing interface, MPI, it was made as a standard in 1994, all right, so that's 17 years ago, nearly, uh, and we haven't made much progress since. Um, I, I, my introduction to computer science was slightly idiosyncratic. I came under the influence of um, Tony Hoare and David May and uh, languages like Occam, uh, which actually taught me the value of a message passing because you could prove things like deadlock, deadlock freedom and things like this. And I think message passing is a very much cleaner um, paradigm than shared memory. Uh, when I was at IBM Research, um, I used, I was probably one of the first and only users of the, the RP3 shared memory programming and it taught me all the pitfalls of, of shared memory and locks and barriers and things like this. Uh, and you certainly can't prove anything about that. So parallelizing is too difficult for, for normal mortals. Could we ever make it automatic? All right, well, uh, the group I was in in IBM was trying to do that. It was, uh, it was called the PTRAN group, uh, and I was probably the first and only real user of the PTRAN parallelizing compiler and programs that had massive amounts of, of geometric parallelism, you know, uh, to do with... Uh, uh, domain decomposition in, 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 in X, Y, and Z, and so on. It could not pick out obvious parallelism. So uh, I became very pessimistic about automatic compilers and uh, 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 compilers doing everything for you. So I do personally believe that we need, at this moment, an interim approach through templates where you have obvious um, paradigms of parallel programming that a, a novice programmer who's never done any parallel programming, can recognize that their problem fits this particular pattern. And then you have armies of experts who've written really good libraries of parallel programming uh, libraries for these particular templates. And that you need to be able to do from multi-core to clusters and up to the cloud. And so I think really what you want to be able to do is to span from multi-core to the cloud transparently. And there's one more ingredient I think you need, which is when you make a choice in parallelizing, the hardware matters and you can have real bad performance penalties and so you need to have some idea when you write your code what the performance penalties are for your particular hardware architecture. So I think you need performance prediction in your programming environment to understand the choices and trade-offs. So that's, I think, we haven't got there yet uh, and really the only things that you program these massively parallel systems are either with MPI or now uh, with data mining, with things like MapReduce, and I think it would be good to try and do better. Whether we will have succeeded 20 years from now, I'm still a little skeptical, but I think we will obviously have to do that. Um, Bill Gates came past my office once in Microsoft, and he was lamenting the fact that Microsoft really have to do parallel programming because the future really is parallel, and we really, as a community, need to solve that. So my call to action on that is really that you know, I think the research funding agencies went to sleep in the 90s not recognizing the importance of parallelism to the future of IT, but now it's really here and we need to do a better job. The second one uh, is what I call semantic computing, the second challenge. Um, and I'll illustrate that. Um, in the National Library of Medicine, abstracts of all the papers that are published in the biomedical field 
not all the biomedical field, but a good percentage of it, are deposited in a thing called Medline or PubMed. And uh, if you average out how many papers are published, it comes down to about two papers a minute are deposited into Medline. Now, there's no way anybody can keep up with the literature at that pace. And it's going to get worse. There are going to be huge amounts of data. There's going to be huge amounts of paper. How can you make sense of it? Well, uh, I mean, one approach is through um, what Tim Berners-Lee calls semantic web, where you have ontologies, you have things like RDF, you have logic languages like OWL. But I suspect that, that life is not quite as precise as, as these logic languages and ontologies would want, and I think, therefore, uh, you need a slightly more fuzzy way of dealing with things because uh, nature is a little more less precise than, than, than is assumed by these uh, logic approaches. And so I think that really uh, what semantic computing, where semantic can be technologies like machine learning, which actually can help you organize, help you get inferences out. They know what you're looking for. You have um, the data when you deposit it has an annotation which is machine readable. And so if you're looking for information about Sirius, the star, it knows that this data contains that, but that data doesn't, and so it brings back to you relevant data. How you mark up all this data is very interesting. How you mark up the papers, how does the computer understand what the content of a paper is, the content of a website, and you have to give it that information. RDF is one way, and you see now with these uh, uh, data.gov type approaches that the linked data, uh, my colleagues at Southampton, Nigel Shadbolt, Wendy Hall, uh, uh, and Jim Hendler at RPI are, are pushing things like linked data. So these are very interesting, and I was sorry I was unable to go to the, the session that Evelyn organized this afternoon, because I think that's a very important area. So the second challenge is really understanding how you can get computers to do more than just compute and store, but to actually help you infer, to act on your behalf. And so, if you like, the third age of computing is the act of participation, where the computers actually are part of, of the solution. They actually filter for you, they can act on your behalf, they can collect data which is relevant to what you're doing, and they can understand what your intent is. So that's, I think, the major grand challenge there, and I think that'll be with us um, for a number of years, and we'll have made some progress in 20 years, but I'm not sure we'll have completely solved it. Judith. Tony, so remember those two, parallel computing and semantic computing. So, we now have Andrew Herbert, who was speaking to us this morning and of course is chairman of Microsoft EMEA, and he's going to give his view of those topics as well. Thank you, Judith. So, um, I've been introduced several times today. This is the time I get to introduce myself and say what I actually do, um, which is great. So yes, I, I was, um, did my PhD at Cambridge um, in the days when you could still get a PhD for writing an operating system and you could still do that in about 12 months. Um, I think it was 25,000 lines of code or something and someone complained it was too long. Um, a, a very different era. Um, so for the last 10 years, um, I've been managing director of the Microsoft Research Lab in Cambridge. I now have um, this new role as chairman. Um, so I still carry some responsibility towards assisting Andrew Blake, as he runs Cambridge, um, the, the two um, more applied research groups in Arkan and Cairo, which is, is fascinating to add to the portfolio, um, doing joint research with customers and, and getting more involved in some of the collaborative programs, and more broadly supporting Craig Mundy, our chief technology, our chief research and strategy officer, on how Microsoft communicates um, broadly with governments and similar organizations like the World Economic Forum to help them understand what the implications might be for how technology could develop, um, how that would impact upon economics and social affairs, um, what some of the big questions might turn out to be um, that will cause politicians to have to respond and invent regulations and policy and so forth, and what might be some of the governance structures. Um, that's very much um, a discussion. It's not a discussion about Microsoft and Microsoft technologies per se. Often these are issues where we find um, we're working in partnership with colleagues from other companies who have precisely the same questions. 
And in many ways, it's, it's a dialogue, and we're both groping towards understanding what the real issues are, what the societal reactions might be, and how we find our way um, through some of those questions. So, for example, topics might be um, information technology and healthcare. It's easy to imagine a point in the future where we can run in the cloud complete biological simulations of ourselves at the genetic level. The genetic data has been collected. Um, what would be the implications of that for healthcare? Medicine would become personalized. The medical treatment would be optimized to a model of you. Maybe we could run those models faster than real time and actually predict what genetic disorders you might be susceptible to, and maybe your, your um, physicians would be able to discuss with you treatments, consequences, and so forth. A very different dynamic to the way they treat us today. Um, if we worry about challenges that we have, um, particularly in Europe with an aging society, might we look to robotics as a solution? Um, when, when you become aged, um, there are two varieties of impairment that, that strike you. Um, it may be physical impairment, and so you might think of robotics in the sense of you know, computing applied to prosthetic limbs and so forth to maintain mobility. Um, robotic devices that can help you stay at home and survive in that environment longer. Um, the, the other source of disability is, is perhaps losing some of your mental faculties. And again, one can think of robotic systems that remember things for you, remind you to do things, even just basic stuff like taking your pills um, and you know, monitoring and so forth. And that could certainly um, reduce the cost of providing health care, which is a very people-driven business. And that makes it very expensive and a difficult business to scale. Um, but it has all kinds of implications. If it's all done by machine, you've, you've lost the social connection, and that's not a, a very attractive thing either. So these are the kind of issues that um, I spend my time talking about, understanding so some of the, the policy questions, some of the implications, and trying to help politicians, civil servants, others, um, think through some of those future scenarios so that we don't put artificial roadblocks in the way today, and where there are things that are going to need public debate and understanding we get those issues on the table early enough so that we don't have some of these silly last-minute panics and un uneducated discussions that have been to the de detriment of, of other technology areas, one thinks of genetically modified food and so forth. So that's what I spend my time doing. Um, when I'm not doing that, my two passions outside of work are old railway engines and old aeroplanes. Um, I restore aeroplanes from the 1920s and earlier, sorry, railway engines from the 1920s and earlier, I fly aeroplanes from the 1930s and later. That seems the right default because the steam engine was in decline from the end of the 1920s and the aeroplane was somewhat improving. <laughs> the oldest one I fly was built in 1936 and actually it flies better than another one I fly that was built in 1950, so there you go. Let's talk about challenges. Um, I think one flows directly from some of the policy things that I'm doing. Um, we are painting a vision of a world which is ever more dependent on software. And indeed, in the panel this morning, we talked about um, the way in which some of the funding agencies are aligning funding programs with societal challenges, whether it's smart energy, coping with climate change, dealing with the aging population. So the research um, funding is, is pushing towards um, solutions that will create those technologies. Um, and so, ever more software. Um, that raises, in my mind, two very fundamental questions. Um, first of all, how do we make developers more productive? Um, again, in, in the morning sessions, we had several people talking about there already being a shortage of skilled professionals to write code, uh, and that, that, that shortage getting more severe. Um, so, the, the smart developers we have have to be able to produce more stuff faster. Um, but also along with that is obviously the whole issue that software has to be trustworthy in a very broad sense. If we are dependent on it, um, it becomes part of a critical infrastructure. Um, and so therefore, we have to trust that it, it can work, that it is secure, um, that it doesn't contain bugs. And as we all know, uh, that's quite a big challenge. Um, and I think um, many of the, the research programs that we had in topics like software engineering and so forth, um, have not really scaled up. And we, you know, we defined the software engineering crisis, I think, at a, a NATO conference in 1960 when I was still wearing short trousers. Um, we still have that crisis. Um, what's different now is the size of a system that we kind of put as being you know, on the boundary of, of, of when it's critical is now probably measured in hundreds of millions of lines of code rather than tens of thousands of lines. Um, 
I had the curious experience earlier in this year of revisiting a computer and some software I wrote as a schoolboy and discovered that the machine had a limit of a matrix of 100 by 100 was the biggest it could invert, and that took nine hours. One just forgets how software has expanded in, in our period. So this is classic computer science. Um, we need language advances and tools to make developers more productive. Um, Tony has hit upon parallel computing as a very, very big part of that. I absolutely agree. Um, it's the old joke, what, what is an elephant? It's a mouse with an operating system. Um, what's the cloud? It's a lot of mice running around. Um, how we turn it into something bigger is going to be a, a big challenge. We clearly have to link formal methods and engineering practice. Um, already in Microsoft's experience as a product company, um, we are having to put both techniques together. Um, Industrial organization and project management alone doesn't see us through with releasing our, our big products. Um, and there's a dirty little secret, um, the microphones are turned off, aren't they? Windows and Office only change about 20% of the code between releases. Much of the rest is code that's come through from previous versions, obviously for compatibility, obviously because the PC is still the PC. So the amount of code that we're changing is a small fraction of the whole out of the, the tens of millions of lines of code in those products. Um, but even to make sure that we can deliver that to the kind of quality levels that our consumers expect and we want to achieve, we're having to deploy formal techniques to verify things alongside good project management of the people, alongside hiring the most skilled developers we can. Um, and we struggle to recruit all the people we need. We'd like to see more progress in those tools work on new programming languages, new techniques and so forth is tremendously important to us. Um, and if I think about how we move away from um, just the kind of products that Microsoft serves, but those that are gonna become part of critical infrastructure, then we need to be much better at writing highly parallel, highly decentralized, um, self-repairing things. Um, we need to understand working on software systems where the model essentially is one of an ongoing continuous experiment. And that's certainly something which online services based on the internet, like web search, social networks, those are showing us how to run development models where you introduce new things in a controlled community of just a few million people on a couple of continents, if, and then, then you rapidly allow it to expand to the, the full web scale and so forth. Um, so I think the whole field of software engineering needs to address those concerns of what will be the 21st century methods of building 21st century software and stop trying to apply 19th century engineering techniques to 20th century software problems. So that's my, my first challenge. The second one is kind of related. Um, again, I, I marked a few moments ago that I got to revisit a mini computer I used as a, as a schoolboy young undergraduate in the, the late 1960s. Um, and it just reminded me how much the world has changed. Um, if I look at the computing environment that the current generation of undergraduates will be trained in, it's a world based on cloud computing, a scalable computing resource of vast power that they can access, that's always on, that can store huge amounts of data for their entire lifetime, and that they can share and collaborate with, with colleagues. Um, it's a world in which the way in which they interact with the computer is increasingly through what in Microsoft we, we term natural user interfaces, whether that's touch screens, gesture, or speech. Um, again, one of, you know, one of these experiences that makes sure as the world has changed, I bought home an Xbox with a Kinect for Christmas. You would if you worked in Microsoft. Um, I'd read all the words about it. It wasn't until I watched my family set it up and realized, apart from plugging it into the wall and pressing the on button, everything from there on out was done by talking at it and waving at it, and gosh, yeah, it wasn't just doing dictation, it wasn't just doing simple command. The whole setup of that system um, was done using anything but a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and actually it's the first games console where I've actually been able to play the games because I'm not terribly good at these hand waggling things. Um, so we're seeing significant changes in the user interface and a user interface where the computer is watching us all the time. It is very kind of science fiction, Star Trek-y but potentially the computer is moving from being a tool we pick up and use to do a job to being something which surrounds us and kind of steps in and assists when it thinks it's appropriate to do so. Um, and so the, the dynamics are changing. If I couple that with um, what I'm seeing um, in many projects in, in the, the Microsoft Research Labs, which I jokingly describe as inference replacing algorithms. Again, when I was an undergraduate, 
you learnt smart algorithms for classic problems like sorting, parsing, and so forth. Um, I now see those challenges being taken on by my colleagues in machine learning. Um, yeah. We do natural language translation by machine learning statistical mappings of one language to another by looking at the, the same text in, in, in two languages and so forth. Um, and I'm seeing an increasing amount of data-driven computing um, going through those inference systems, building technologies that give the impression of being very smart and intelligent. And I don't think I'm falling in the trap of, of you know, the, the old vision of artificial intelligence. The machine is just grinding the data, but it can do some pretty cool stuff doing that in a very helpful way. And if I couple that with the user interface, I see as game changing a paradigm going on around me as when the, the personal computer came along and disrupted the, the mini computers and the mainframes that defined the, the undergraduate program when I was a student. So again, how do we design and build these systems is a big question. And my call to action there is I think we could learn a lot by looking at how the computer games industry, which in some sense is at the front of, of many of these transitions, um, how they couple creative people from the world of media, artists, designers, graphics designers, um, musicians, and so forth, um, to create their software alongside the computer scientists who do the, the event simulation or the physics of the basic game. Um, how do we bring those two communities together? Because if our technology is becoming more humanistic, um, more, more ambient, if you like, and these are all words we've had in our vocabulary for a long time, but I think the technologies have finally come together that we can deliver these systems. Um, I think the computer is going to become more of a social animal, more of a humanistic animal, and so some of the arts and humanities expertise needs to come alongside the engineering expertise. How do we do that? And then we link it back to the first question of, and we're struggling to write the software anyway. So I think we have big challenges, but also fantastic opportunities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. So we've got there. Uh, formal proving of software and also the humanistic approach and the effects thereof. So now we have Andrew Blake, who is our um, recently appointed Managing Director at Microsoft Research Cambridge. He's going to give us his two challenges and calls to action. Very good. Well, um, uh, you asked Judith for us to say first a little bit who uh, about who we are, and um, so I, I wanted to say a, a little bit about how I meant, uh, how I got into research. I never meant to be a researcher. It was a, a kind of accident. I studied uh, mathematics, and then I uh, got interested in uh, in device physics, and went and sort of built lasers and things. And then I went and worked for an electronics company. It never really occurred to me to do research. But um, while I was at this company, I went to a lecture by a series of lectures by a man called Joel Trussell, who was specializing in image processing, and he um, showed some pictures of x-rays of people's lungs, uh, which in 1980 were not very clear, rather blurry things, and he was explaining how he represented the picture as, um, as a matrix and uh, did some matrix operations on this picture, which all sounds very, um, very dry, but then what came out of that was a clearer picture. And I thought it was rather marvelous that this um, uh, rather abstract and cerebral mathematics could look so beautiful on the page and uh, was inspired by that and started to look for opportunities to do that kind of work myself. So I went to, I was in Edinburgh at the time and Edinburgh University was one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence which was actually having a bit of a dip around 1980. Artificial intelligence is a term which has uh, gone up and down rather a lot and sometimes you can say it with pride and other times you don't really want to mention that that's what you work on. But actually, you know, on balance, I think I'm quite proud of the, the term artificial intelligence and um, especially as our colleagues in biology, you know, um, manfully trying to map out the, the physiology of the brain, I think, I think it's fair to say are finding it pretty difficult to explain how intelligence works. So I think we as as software people have our own um, metaphors for uh, information processing and I think we actually have a very good stab at, at getting a deeper understanding of what intelligence really is and that was what um, inspired me and, and I got into building machines that did vision uh, which in 1980 was uh, a little bit hopeless and typical uh, I know that there are, I'll be getting into mercury delay line memory stories soon but um, uh, 
a typical image took me 24 hours to process on a um, PDP, whatever, 1134. And um, so that didn't seem like anything that you'd be doing uh, in anger and making money out of at the time. I did actually go to, uh, parallel processing has been mentioned as a theme, I did actually go to UCL around 1981, I guess it was, where they'd built a very special parallel computer called the CLIP for doing uh, image processing, and I'd written a program up in Edinburgh, the one that took uh, the 24 hours to detect the edges of, of, um, in images, and I put, put the, loaded the program into the computer, put my keys on the table and moved them around, and there was the real live, real-time edge-detected version of my keys moving around on the screen. And I have to say I was beside myself with the excitement because, you know, to see something like that in 1981 was really something. Now, to, um, uh, there was a whole lot of sort of academic career after that, which I won't go into, um, but um, a point did come at which I thought perhaps one could think about building machines, uh, real live machines that did machine vision, and at that point, I think um, the strategy which a lot of people who've worked in artificial intelligence and have seen practical opportunities have adopted is that what were failures in artificial intelligence, because, of course, you know, the, the, the things we try to do in artificial intelligence don't end up producing autonomous machines, can become successes when you put them in a new context. So the new context may be that the problem is somewhat more restrictive than the general AI problem of how to ma uh, behave in a complex world. Um, or it may be that a human is brought into the loop so that the technology is only assistive, whereas previously it was expected to be completely automatic. And I think there are many examples um, in the image processing, of course, are the ones I'm fondest of, but um, many other areas where things which were, which were regarded as failures in artificial intelligence, I mean, the whole field of machine learning is like that, become successes when you um, constrain them in that way. So I guess the last biographical uh, thing I want to say is, well, now I've uh, inherited this um, uh, laboratory from uh, Andrew and his predecessor, Roger, and they've spent 13 years putting together what is really, I would say, a very sophisticated institution and with a lot of talented people in it. And um, as I think uh, Andrew said in his talk right at the beginning of the day, that it's, it's all founded on a belief in uh, basic research and that the way to make... Um, a powerful laboratory, um, uh, even one that is um, having a, a practical impact, is nonetheless to build um, a, a research laboratory that is based on belief in basic research and being embedded in the research community, that's all of you, and playing a full, uh, uh, having a, a full life, playing a full part in academic research. And I, I totally believe on that. Um, but of course, I'm also very interested in how that uh, foundation of basic research can feed technical innovation in a company like ours, like Microsoft. And so I think for me the challenge over the next few years is to sort of pursue those uh, twin tracks, to hold true to the faith in uh, basic research, which I absolutely believe, but also to push through the innovations. Now, as for, my, um, as for my challenges, well, actually Andrew has set the scene very well for me. I mean, his second challenge is uh, closely related to both of my challenges. So... Um, the first one is to do with, I guess, what is coming to, be called, uh, coming to be called natural user interface. And that is that, you know, we're getting now um, machinery which is capable of responding to um, uh, humans in more, f more flexible and more subtle ways. And so the Kinect system, which has been developed for, um, for gaming commercially, I think of as being the last, in a, uh, the, the, the most recent in a, a line of innovation in uh, human computer interaction. So, you know, we had green screen and command line years ago, and then we had mouse and windows, and more recently we've had touch and multi-touch. And finally, what we have is this kind of no-touch paradigm where you can uh, move and act, and those, those movements are, are picked up and we have kind of action at a distance. And it's not just the visual side of that, but all of the other technologies that go with that. So I guess uh, it's probably not been made so much of, but inside the Kinect camera, there's very sophisticated speech understanding. And one of the things that doesn't work very often with speech understanding is that if you're 10 feet away from the microphone, try it with your mobile phone if it, if it does 
uh, speech recognition to call up your contacts, you'll find that at 10 feet it's, it's not working because the uh, kind of cocktail party effect and the uh, problems of um, reverberation, which we take for granted because somehow with our two ears we're doing an amazing job of, uh, of dealing with that, objectively is a horrible problem. And uh, uh, if you're a machine, what you hear in a reverberative environment is uh, you know, infinite numbers of images of me in all the walls, all talking at once with delays, and it's a horrific problem. And underneath the uh, Kinect camera, you uh, won't see it unless you look very hard, is an array of microphones, which in some ways is uh, beginning to do what uh, we do with our two ears, that is to unpick all of these echoes. So that's just one example of um, the sophisticated technology that is part of the NUI landscape. But there's also eye tracking. Uh, companies like Toby make, uh, make fantastic eye trackers. They've just released... Uh, a laptop which has eye tracking in the screen. So this is something which I think is relatively unexploited in, in user interface. Uh, there's also um, emotion detection. Um, the uh, uh, MIT Media Lab have some amazing demonstrations of, of subtlety in uh, discriminating human emotions, which is actually based partly on autism research, believe it or not, where, of course, uh, a lot of the study is about failure to, do, to detect emotions on the faces of other people. The Media Lab even have a an amazing demonstration where uh, you open your laptop and in the bottom right hand corner it'll tell you how fast your heart is beating. I just couldn't believe it when I first saw it, although you know, now I've had time to think about it, I guess it's not quite so surprising, but it can, can look at you with its webcam and tell you your heart rate. I think it's pretty amazing. So th there's quite a portfolio of, of sensors emerging and I think this is my challenge in, in this department. I think it's a huge um, opportunity to make new kinds of computers, the kinds of embedded computers that Andrew was talking about that are, where well, you don't necessarily think of them so much as computers, they're sort of uh, more uh, part of your environment and um, uh, machines that just react in a way that you expect them to react. But what is going to be the killer paradigm in no-touch computing? I think we really don't know. I think we're at this, you know, it took a long time after the invention of the touch screen to invent what we now recognize as killer paradigms that everybody loves in touch and multi-touch. And I think we're only at the beginning of that with Nui. And I, uh, it, I, I dare say it'll take another 10 years and it'll take the, um, the thinking of the whole um, uh, computer science community, I, I believe, to, uh, before we understand what's the, what's the way to use these, um, these interfaces. Now, I've uh, talked rather a lot, so for my second challenge, I'll just say very briefly what I think it is. And that is the other, another theme that Andrew mentioned is um, uh, machine learning and that machine learning is being built into so many uh, different systems now, especially systems that we interact with on, on the web, um, collaborative uh, filtering, systems that prioritize information. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, and this, uh, this again harks on a theme that both Tony and Andrew raised, unfortunately, this technology is not at the fingertips of developers. I mean, it's a, at the moment, it's a sophisticated technology that you need at least a, a PhD in machine learning really to know, the, uh, to be able to manipulate this. And um, so the question is, how will this ever get into the mainstream of software development? And I think it, it has to get there in order to implement intelligent systems or systems with intelligence in the kind of uh, volume and ubiquity that we need. But machine intelligence technology is anything but mainstream for software developers um, at the moment. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. So now we have Peter Lee, our last speaker. Peter is uh, a distinguished scientist. Uh, that's a special designation within Microsoft and also managing director of our Microsoft Research Redmond Lab. He's going to come up here. Peter? I'll stay seated. You're going to stay seated? <laughs> Do you want me to show your square? Sure. Yeah. Let me show your square. All right. Hold on. I've got a square for Peter. And um, why don't I uh, start while you're doing you that? Start. Um, so, uh, so thank you uh, for having me here. It's uh, very exciting. Um, uh, I am, I'm new to Microsoft and Microsoft Research, um, having um, just started my sixth month uh, in, uh, in the company. So I'm learning a lot. Um, as uh, Judith mentioned, I'm the managing director of the Redmond Lab, which is, uh, in my experience, and probably in most of yours, a pretty large place, about 350 uh, PhD researchers and engineers. Um, but uh, one of the shocking things is uh, within Microsoft, 
it's a tiny blip of almost nothing. Um, and that's actually a very nice place to be because um, we're very high impact, uh, high impact out of proportion with our size. Um, so the joke I like to say is that when a new graphical element needs to be added to Microsoft Office, uh, they'll hire 350 people just for that. And so, uh, so we're not, uh, not too big. Um, so before I came here, I was for a long time, for 22 years, a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University um, in the computer science department. And, um, and uh, at the end, uh, the head of computer science. I, um, I like to say that that's a, a, a cat herding job. And so I was herding a lot of cats. Of course, in a university, I had the job of herding cats, but no authority to do anything uh, with them. Um, after President Obama was elected, um, I joined a small team in Washington to restart computer science research at DARPA, which is the Blue Sky Research Agency uh, for the Defense Department. Um, and, um, and there I had absolute military authority and quite a bit of funds, um, but not as many smart people, so very few cats to herd um, there. Um, and so now I'm at uh, Microsoft Research. And I have um, a great deal of authority and uh, lots of cats to herd by the prime directive that I'm not allowed to do any herding. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so uh, I refer to this as the nirvana of research management because, uh, in fact, the job very simply is to try to hire the best people, um, make sure that all of our researchers and engineers are fully resourced, and then just get out of the way. Um, and, and in fact, not to try to tell people what to do. And that's a very nice. Uh, really a nice job to have. Um, now, uh, I, uh, I can't actually describe to you what my job is because I'm still learning it. Um, but I do uh, have a way of looking at research in computer science uh, that I think is distinct from research in, <coughs> say, the physical sciences or in mathematics. Uh, and so I use a, a quadrant diagram. And so if you look uh, at the screen here, uh, on the x-axis, uh, imagine um, the spectrum of research problems or activities spanning uh, short-term or managed risk kinds of activities near the origin. And as you go out, uh, research activities that are much riskier or for which, uh, which demand patience in order to see payoff. And then on the y-axis are choices of problems from reactive problems problems that are defined for you, pain points from product developers or societal grand challenges, uh, all the way up to more open-ended search for truth and beauty. Uh, let's refer to that as disruptive problems. And so now, uh, if you imagine this whole space of research problems, and I've put names in the quadrants, um, well, uh, in Microsoft Research, at least in Redmond, uh, the demand that I have for the research staff is that we have great impact across this entire space in all four quadrants. And so uh, in the blue sky area, for example, uh, we do significant amounts of uh, just completely open-ended, um, even you might call navel-gazing research. And this is a picture from our uh, efforts in topological quantum computing, uh, for example, uh, which is quite uh, open-ended and, and uh, theoretical, uh, spanning computer science to physics. In the mission-focused area, um, we do a lot uh, across MSR, um, so we're engaged in a holy war with Google, for example, in the quality of search. Um, and, um, and we have uh, you know, 40 or 50 PhDs working very hard uh, to, uh, to improve uh, our search product and online products. Uh, in the sustaining area, uh, these are less time critical, but every bit is important to improve upon every day. And so we do a tremendous amount of research that is aimed at improving our internal processes, improving the quality of our foreign language translation every day, uh, improving for today 14 different product groups uh, our internal <coughs> code development and uh, code quality processes, uh, as well as impacting products uh, for, other, for our application developer, development communities to do better. And then finally, uh, my favorite quadrant, which is the upper left quadrant, uh, is, uh, for lack of a better term, the game-changing quadrant, where looking at the world as we know it today, uh, what can we do that would be really game-changing or disruptive? And uh, the work uh, in Nui and, and Connect that Andrew mentioned is one of the prime examples here, where 
there was really a skunk works of sorts uh, to really to change the way in which we interact today with game consoles and tomorrow with computers in, more generally. And so as I look uh, to uh, what my primary role is uh, as, a, as a lab director, uh, it's to try to arrange and organize uh, our lab to achieve uh, impact in all four quadrants. So uh, that's enough about that. So now uh, Judith asked uh, to look ahead 20 years, and um, that's, uh, I feel a little sheepish about that uh, because it's sort of a tall <laughs> order. Um, I'm also sh feeling sheepish because um, we are four Microsoft people, and it sort of gives the impression that we're the font of all wisdom and knowledge, which is definitely not true. Uh, in fact, part of the reason that we exist in Microsoft Research is to connect with you uh, and the research community, because you are the font of all the ideas and knowledge, and we just organize ourselves to engage as deeply as possible with you so that we can keep up. Um, so as I thought about uh, this challenge, I decided first to go back to 1991, go back 20 years, and see if I can project forward from there. So 1991 turns out to be a very important year in computing. I started to look at research results and realized I would be insulting some people by not mentioning them. So I'm not going to talk about research from 1991, but instead about major computing achievements. Uh, so in 1991, in August, Tim Berners-Lee uh, posted his first executive summary of the new World Wide Web project on alt.hypertext to a stunning array of 214 subscribers. <laughs> uh, Linus Torvalds uh, on comp.ox.minix uh, posted, made a post asking some questions um, that um, were pertinent to a new kernel project that he was just launching. <laughs> um, of course, that uh, kernel project became Linux. Uh, Jim Gosling, uh, he uh, had gone to Sun and formed what he called the Green Team uh, with the goal to create a new programming language for what he was envisioning would be a new uh, realm of connected devices. Um, that, of course, became Java. Um, there was a lot of news about Boeing and Airbus um, in their new airplanes. They were putting as much as two million lines of code uh, into their airplanes. And this was sparking a huge amount of debate and interest uh, in the whole uh, realm of uh, embedded uh, software systems. Uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows, I should mention Microsoft, um, was transitioning from Windows 3.0 to 3.1 during 1991. Uh, with a major revolution uh, incorporating 16-color graphics, 4-bit gra uh, <laughs> graphics, uh, and incorporating almost 4 million lines of code, um, and sparking really a revolution in graphical user interfaces on the desktop, as well as um, <coughs> uh, setting Microsoft, the corporation, on the path of really starting to worry deeply about how in the world to manage such large code bases. Uh, and then um, AI, I want to say something about AI. Um, <laughs> AI, of course, leading up to 1991, there was tremendous optimism, huge amounts of progress. But 1991 was the depth of the AI winter, the second AI winter. Um, companies like List Machines and Symbolics were, uh, were considered to be dead or dying mm -hmm. uh, because ordinary PCs were surpassing them in strength. Expert systems were hitting a wall, a scaling wall. They were just proving to be too brittle. Uh, DARPA, their strategic computing initiative, uh, in 1991 decided to terminate funding for AI, um, mm -hmm. having uh, accused the field of uh, over-promising and under-delivering. And the Jap Japanese fifth generation initiative uh, was at that time in 1991 clearly failing to deliver uh, real results. And so we see a high point in AI um, through the 80s, 70s and 80s uh, hitting a low point in 1991. So given all of that, where are we going to be in, um, in 2031, uh, which is a crazy thing to think about. Um, and so I did try to think of two challenges. Uh, one thing that's not a challenge is um, that it looks to me like today, um, 20 years since 1991, we have fully emerged from the AI winter. And AI is on a high point again. Uh, so one could predict in 2031, we'll be in the, we'll be in the third AI winter. <laughs> So, of, of course, by 2031, machines will see just as well as people, maybe better. They'll hear and understand just as well as people. They'll reason and solve problems uh, as well as people. 
Um, but they will be accused, the whole field will be, again be accused of under-delivering and over-promising because people will expect common sense reasoning, causal inference, uh, kind of invisibility, lack, uh, uh, no need to operate things, and natural mobility in the physical space. And all of those things uh, will still not be with us in 2031. That's a provocative prediction I'm making. And I can imagine a headline in 2031 uh, in April, uh, saying something like, the Chinese robo-soccer team has been knocked out of the first round in the FIFA World Cup, sparking a Chinese government termination of funding for the program. And this will be the, uh, this will be the third AI winter. Um, but uh, you know, 2051 will be good for AI again. Um, so now about software technology, um, and I, uh, I had the uh, advantage of reading the challenges that were sent around by email by the other three panelists, um, uh, and um, I've decided to try to take a different approach and be a little bit provocative. So let me say that in 2031, um, we will start to see quantum uh, machines based on quantum uh, processes. Um, however, uh, silicon-based machines will still be with and will, and will still be the prevalent uh, platform for computing. But reductions in feature size and energy will mean that the components fundamentally at all scales, from transistor all the way to large data uh, center systems, uh, will become increasingly uh, unreliable. And that if we're lucky, the components might uh, have some some probability distribution uh, that will describe their unreliability, uh, but maybe not. And therefore, um, our future computing systems will either give unreliable results or will involve programming systems that are tolerant of that kind of faultiness or uncertainty. And so um, I'm going to predict that there will be some need increasingly for uncertainty tolerance at all scales, dealing with uncertainties in massive parallelism, as have been mentioned before, um, in uh, totally probabilistic and demand-driven computing models uh, without clocks, reconfigurability, um, and high scalability. And along with those um, formal reasoning techniques uh, in, in those regimes. So that's, that's one uh, prediction. Second prediction about 2031, again trying to be provocative, is uh, software development is plumbing. And so uh, imagine again a head newspaper headline, um, use U United States Software uh, Programmers Union protests lack of tariffs on Chinese software factory output. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, well. Imagine a world in 2031 where we have robust and very usable and clear high-level specifications for software. So ordinary consumers are able to write down what they want and you can just outsource to a uh, software development shop the creation of software that meets that, uh, that specification. And there's complete information symmetry. Consumers know what they're getting uh, and uh, producers uh, are able to charge for that. And now, uh, imagine gigantic uh, software factories manned by very large numbers of machines and very large numbers of people who are able to reach into massive uh, libraries of components through advanced search uh, techniques and auto adaptation and automatic programming to uh, pluck things out of these libraries, adapt the code, put them all together, and deliver it to you with a proof that this meets the specification that you've, you've, uh, that you've uh, asked for. So that level of autosynthesis um, is, uh, is a second prediction that I would have um, that would get us to a state where software, the creation of software, uh, and the installation of software becomes as ordinary uh, in the world um, as, say, hiring a plumber is to uh, outfitting this building or, or your house. And so as I uh, look at those two things, and I have no idea about 2031 if those uh, will come to pass or not, um, 
what are the barriers? Well, certainly um, there is, uh, there will need to be a continuing respect for really foundational research. And I'm not going to say basic research because I think increasingly in computer science, there's no real distinction between basic and applied research. Every working computer science researcher I know of has both applied and basic uh, sides uh, to him or herself. Um, but there are foundational concepts, concepts that don't necessarily connect in obvious ways to the existing practice. And, and so uh, one of the things that I worry about uh, as a community uh, is uh, our continuing commitment to really foundational work. If we're imagining uh, looking at computing uh, in a substrate where every component, where every transistor is unreliable, uh, that requires a level of rethinking uh, and a foundational, respectful foundational work that, that I fear is starting to fade uh, today, and so we'll have to restore that. Uh, and then secondly, um, to be open to the idea that uh, we, as if we think of software as plumbing, the idea that we may be able to have mechanisms to mobilize very large numbers of people in some coherent way to solve problems, even problems as complicated as uh, developing new, uh, new pieces of software. And so uh, those two things, to me, the two barriers I think that I would I think are most important are um, reinforcing and restoring respect for foundational research and computing, uh, and secondly, um, ensuring uh, that we have a continuous engagement and think hard about models for mobilizing uh, large numbers of people to solve problems. That's it, thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Well, now you know why they're executives. We finished bang on time. Um, we're going to now open the panel to the floor. And I think we've got um, another mic somewhere. Do we? Yes, there we go. So, who is going to fire a question at our people first? Right over there. There's a microphone. Ah, oh, well. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Okay. Well, you, you. Wow. Um, uh, briefly, well, well, since yes. Peter has a mic here, we, we'll pass it to Peter first. Computer science education. So it's a it's an important question. I, um, I, uh, obviously, in com in the computer science research community, we've been fretting about um, education for a while. Um, one thing that. Um, so I don't have a direct answer, but I, I do have a remark that's related to, to your question. Um, one thing I think that we sometimes forget about is um, that uh, increasingly students who opt to go to college to study math or science, uh, increasingly that's an odder and odder choice in our societies. Um, it's sort of the modern day equivalent of joining a monastery. And, um, and I mean that in a good way. And, um, and another, uh, that's another way of saying that, um, uh, that people who opt to do that are special in a good way. And sometimes I worry in computer science, uh, when we try to sell uh, computing education to young people, um, we emphasize too much the practical. You know, computer science is a great education to have because it'll teach you what goes, in, goes on in your phone or it'll teach you how YouTube works, or teach you how the internet works. And that's all great, and people do want to have that kind of real world impact, but we shouldn't forget that there's a natural idealism in the best students who opt for a math or science education that is attracted to um, the awe and wonder of the universe, and is interested in more esoteric ideas and concepts. And so, uh, 
Uh, one, so I always feel like one element that's missing in our marketing of computer science to young people is that we don't, we're, we seem afraid to talk about the, the, the esoteric in our field. And we have a lot of things. What can be more esoteric than the idea of a Turing machine and the idea of limits on computation? And we hardly ever talk about those things when we sell our field. So I think I'd like to build on, on those thoughts and perhaps Europeanize them. We really do have as a community, I think, to engage with schools, to um, have school teachers talking about computing. Um, and to do that, we have to make the discipline attractive. And I think we need to do more than just um, the traditional talking about programming and algorithms. If we can talk about some of the, the challenges in computing, if we can talk about some of the applications and where they're going. Um, in a, my own experience, when I was running the, the Cambridge lab, we started a, a Christmas lecture um, for local schools. And we talk about some of our more exotic research. And we got fantastic feedback from the teachers and, and kids who attended, which boiled down to, we didn't know computer scientists did that. That's interesting. Um, and so as we, as we run this thing from year to year, we kind of put less and less traditional computing in and more and more of some of the applications, some of the ways in which computing ideas are being applied to, to other fields. So I think we have a huge education task within the education community. And we have to reach out and help schools understand this. They're not going to find it for themselves. Um, and so things like student ambassador schemes and so forth. Then I think the, the other huge challenge we have is, as is a terribly male-dominated industry, there aren't enough girls in computing. Um, Karen Spark-Jones gave a, a, a wonderful um, talk when she was collecting various professional accolades towards the end of her, of her life. She said, computing is too important to be left to the boys. Um, I think she was spot on. That is something we absolutely have to address. And we have to find out which are the aspects of computing that are attractive to, to females and will bring them into discipline. What are the topics that they want to work on and, and contribute? And I think you know, there's a lot of leadership in the US, in the emerging economies, um, they, they, I think, are doing a much better job. In Europe, we're very much lagging behind in that area. And I think it's something we absolutely have to address because we're missing out on half the talent. Uh, just, just a couple of comments. Uh, I was very taken by Ken Wood's talk this morning about uh, gadgeteer and teaching computing through, through systems like that. Uh, um, in our uh, Microsoft Research Connections, we, we've had an institute for robotics uh, for teaching where you give students a robot which they learn programming by programming a robot which is slightly more interesting perhaps than, than a, a traditional platform and we also have a games for learning institute where actually can you teach mathematical concepts to 10 year olds by using games uh, this is part of this agenda called the gamification of education being somewhat old I'm, I'm slightly skeptical of that uh, but maybe that's me being old uh, one thing idea I liked was in a recent book by Gordon Bell uh, and Jim Gemmell called Total Recall. It's about uh, the idea that he was recording every part of his life so he could re record the lectures, he could record the examinations, the material was available to tutors, they could find out where they, the student had problems, they could go and intervene, the student could go back and relook at the lecture again. It was actually storing all this sort of relevant personal data that you can go back and review and then add to as you go along. And I, I found that attractive and conceivably something that would actually play a role in the future. Well, first of all, I think I, I would, I'd like to say that we should um, reinforce the theoretical um, parts of computer teaching a little bit um, in tune with your idea and uh, my reason for saying is is because it lasts better I think some of the more uh, the, the, the de detailed practical things that we teach which of course people need to know become out of date more quickly but actually we're um, teaching young people ways of thinking as much as as particular skills which need uh, in some ways to last them for life and we're teaching them at a time when uh, at a unique time when that they're uniquely able to pick those um, pick those things up. The other thing I wanted to say is that I think computer science may have overcompensated on the business versus uh, business of discrete versus continuous mathematics. And you know there was a sort of rebellion uh, a few decades ago when the computer science departments were breaking free of mathematics departments, and they wanted to show that you know they, they were different than what they did was discrete mathematics. And in doing that, they've given away a lot of the the fun that is based on uh, uh, continue on analysis essentially um, to 
engineers and other disciplines. And uh, certainly my experience of, of teaching in Oxford was that um, uh, the, uh, the stu uh, and, and I was teaching in an engineering department, was that, that students were really turned on by some of the, uh, the stuff that was based on continuous mathematics because the applications were so uh, inspiring and also because it is uh, a whole kind of um, uh, tool set for modeling which uh, you absolutely, absolutely need to know to do a, a, a whole range of uh, things like scientific computing and the, the business of understanding uncertainty, which has become so important. So, um, you know, continuous mathematics, bring it back. I don't mind. Uh, Ian Phillips from ARM. I've got a little bit of a problem with the consistency of the, uh, uh, the uses of terminology. So we're talking about mathematics and then we're talking about computation and then at some stage somebody's talking about a computer and the next time they're talking about a piece of hardware. Um, I have a problem that, that basically says that when you have a, take a smartphone, you're actually talking about an optimized package of a, 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 an implementation of effectively a mathematical uh, model. The model is partitioned such that it runs on various component platforms inside that. So the, the radio, for example, is a, uh, a mathematical model starting off from an, an analog signal which appears on an input and it's processed. Uh, <clears throat> sooner or later it may very well be digitized. It's going to be fed through some degree of processing, some of which is dedicated, another of which will be, let's say, computer engine assisted. Um, and I think that the, the overall system, however, is, is the design process then is a process of understanding what the target processing required is. An optimized design is achieved when the mapping of that algorithm to appropriate components within the system is adequate. Not as good as it could be, but good enough to meet the uh, uh, non-functional aspects of the spec. Would you guys like to comment on any of that? I mean, could you crystallize that into a question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question is, is there such a thing as software, a computer, uh, a, a computer science or such, or is it only a process of mathematical analysis and mapping? So I think um, some of us have, have been having a debate in the UK actually as to what oops. some of us in the UK have been having a debate as to what computer science is as a discipline. Is it mathematics? Is it engineering? Um, I think one of the fascinating things um, from when I, I ran the Cambridge lab and, and grew it from the 40 people it was when I first arrived to the 140 or so it was when I handed it over to, to Andrew. Um, was how we found ourselves adding alongside computer scientists, um, psychologists, ethnographers, designers, um, a whole range of other talents um, that we have to bring together. And so I think writing software is more than a mathematical process. Um, and just relying on formal techniques, I think, is, is insufficient. Um, I don't think formal techniques resolve fitness for purpose. They tell you what you've built matches the specification, but you still have the question of having specified something useful or, or exciting. Um, so you have to look more broadly. There's certainly a very strong engineering aspect, and I thought Peter was hinting a lot at um, engineering, um, the way we design systems to make them more tolerant of low-level failures and so forth. And I, I think of myself as more an engineer than perhaps any other discipline, because I'm hopeless at maths and I'm not a very good scientist. So engineer is the last refuge of that particular kind of scoundrel. Um, so yes, I think it is, it is very mixed in the, the disciplines of the organization. And I think one of the challenges perhaps for the theory community is to find the right blend between theory and pragmatics. Um, and it's interesting in some of the work that colleagues in the Cambridge lab have been doing on software verification for low-level software in the operating system. Um, while they're not necessarily able to prove correctness in every case, their tools can quite often say, this is an interesting piece of code, I can't unravel it, and you parachute in an expert at that point who can bring other skills to bear. 
And that's, you know, in some situations, you go up and say that's a broken formal tool. It doesn't quite do the job. But actually deploying a tool that does quite a lot of heavy lifting and can point to the places where it needs more information is quite useful. So yes, I think we have to bring pragmatics, engineering, design, all those things to bear on how we think about the production of software. I, um, I, I agree with all of that, and um, not to be Im impolite, but I think it's a silly question. Um, and the, uh, um, I hope you take that in the right spirit. Um, let me uh, explain. Um, first of all, uh, as academics, uh, and I still count myself as an academic, uh, that hasn't been beaten out of me yet, um, one thing that we are all susceptible, overly susceptible to is um, worrying about taxonomies and taxonomizing everything. And so, um, so let me uh, tell you a story from my uh, childhood. I grew up in a household with a uh, physicist as a father and a chemist as a mother. Um, computers in high school started to become interesting to me, but it was clearly conveyed to me that computers were just a tool for the real intellectual pursuits of the physical sciences. Um, when I went to college, um, not actually being attracted to physics, I became a math student, which was definitely second tier status uh, intellectually, but at least it wasn't computers. And, um, uh, and I became, a, 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 had a, earned a math degree. And then um, I ran across the early uh, work by Dan Scott and Christopher Strachey, uh, where they were musing about information systems and uh, about various conundrums in set theoretic interpretations of computable functions. And at that moment, at least as a math student, it became very clear to me that the notion of computation was something new that hadn't been contemplated before uh, in a serious way, in the, exactly the same way, at least since Gödel and, and Turing, and that there was something fundamentally new. And whether you want to call that mathematics or computer science or software or whatever, is sort of beside the point. There was something new uh, for humanity to discover and understand. And, uh, and, and I think it's therefore completely important and respectable discipline. I can't resist making one comment, what I think is the difference. There's a whole uh, army of people who do work on PRAMs, which assumes that uh, you can have large numbers of processes uh, and you can get instantaneous access and so on. You write all sorts of algorithms. I think that's mathematics. What is real is when you have a system where you have multiple processes, but you have network contention, you have memory contention, you have cache hierarchies, then you have to do some engineering. So actually that's, I think, the difference. I vote for... Um... You could have another question right now. That's right. Yeah. Step one. <coughs> Okay, Stefan Jenichen, Technical University of Berlin. I think it's very hard to, to predict the future, and that's why the discussion is also a bit difficult. So, but I would like to, to give you one question which is also very difficult to answer. <laughs> I mean, we have been talking about all our research being more or less incremental, yeah? And I think that's what we experience now, yeah? We see that we have incrementally uh, progress, yeah, and we will see or we try to imagine how, how the world would, would look like in 20 years from now. Can you imagine anything, any technological breakthrough which would change the way in which we do our science today or our, our business today or profession today? One example would be P equals NP, yeah, but <laughs> just one example. Can I give you another, which is, I think, when, when okay. nanotechnology becomes real, we're talking 20 years in the future, and Thank when you. we have, actually, Peter was talking about the unreal, you can't shrink the present technology because they will get unreliable when you only have a few electrons in the gate. But when you get down to devices with a few atoms, you'll do things differently, and that will hugely change things. And, for example, at the moment, we have you know, all this worry about multi-core and parallel computing. Maybe it'll be different, and energy loss will be not the problem when you get down to, uh, you know, devices with few atoms. So I think nanotechnology is going to be a big, big driver in the future. Nan nanotubes, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any, there was anything a question else? there on the left. Can yeah. I also pick up one while we're moving the mic? Okay, while we move the mic. <laughs> so I'll give you one other, which I think comes in um, down the same path. Um, and one of my colleagues in Cambridge, Luca Cardelli, is looking at this. When we have systems that self-assemble and build themselves, 
from a specification. Um, he's looking at that in the context of DNA. DNA is a system that knows how to replicate, assemble, and build new structures. Um, and it works at the granularity of atoms, which is what we seem to need because we're struggling to build silicon at these fine grains. So I think if we can build self-replicating systems that can be given a specification, and then go and build something else, that will change the game considerably for us too. But DNA may not be the right route, but it's a nice world in which to experiment with those ideas. Does it work? Yeah. <clears throat> I was uh, going to ask uh, a simple question. It could be also difficult, I don't know. Uh, uh, Microsoft is a software company, and uh, I wonder whether you know what the main source of income for Microsoft would be in 20 years. Which software system? Uh, I mean, I was at recently at the executive retreat, and Steve Barmer interestingly described the company as a devices and services company. I'm confident we will have something we'll call an operating system and we'll call it Windows. I'd be very surprised it has many lines of code in common with the thing that we call an operating system of Windows today. Um, so first of all, I hope it exists. I, I just um, <laughs> invested in a house in the Seattle area. And uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, 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 you know, I, I think uh, Tony mentioned um, services and it, it does seem to me that um, that we could see a, a real proliferation of platforms and devices and that increasingly Microsoft will want its software uh, on a wider and wider array of uh, devices, both devices that it uh, works uh, on and builds, but also devices other people uh, will build and, and, and want to buy. And so um, that seems to me to imply, at least in the very long term, that that a software company like Microsoft and any other software company will at least have to have some part of the business that is able to respond very quickly to, um, uh, to satisfying new specifications for software. I think you can rest assured that any uh, hints as to what this business will be that you hear from this panel will be incorrect because otherwise we, would have, uh, we wouldn't be here, we'd be rushing off and doing it. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Jan Bosch, Chalmers University of Technology. Um, very interesting presentations by all of you. I very much enjoyed listening to what you were sharing with us. But I did notice that you take, took a very strong technology-driven innovation approach. You came from what are the physical or technical possibilities that, are, that will be created in the coming 20 years. Now, Last time I checked, Microsoft was a for-profit company, so I want to pick up a little bit on where the last question left it off. We've now been talking about technology, but what are the consumer or customer use cases that you think you will be solving 20 years from now? Because I think that those use cases or those jobs that you solve for your customers are the ones that your customers will, in the end, pay you for and consequently, you'll be generating your revenue from. So I would very much like to get your perspective on what are the new jobs or the new use cases that you believe you will be solving for customers in the coming decade or two decades? I, th I think it's clear what some of the big opportunities are. I guess one of the biggest ones is health, and that's something which uh, in the last few years the company has taken um, a big interest in. And you know, the other big ones are the ones that matter a lot to people generally, and that's transport and energy. And uh, you know, uh, I think those are going to engage a lot of uh, serious attention in the next 20 years. Andrew? Can I, I pick up that ball and run with it a bit further? I think Andrew is, is spot on. Um, and indeed, if you look at the company, you'll see we have some product groups now who are much more aligned with verticals than the Kind of traditional horizontal view of Microsoft. Um, I think of our healthcare solutions group. 
What is interesting in um, that model is we look for opportunities where technology innovation of the kind that we know how to do can change the game. That's certainly the case in, in healthcare. Healthcare we see today as essentially a very expensive people-driven industry that hasn't, if you like, had the productivity forces drive through it that administration and clerical work, um, how they were affected by the personal computer and personal productivity. So in some sense, the question is, you know, where are the other worlds where we can do a Windows and Office to those worlds by the use of technology that changes the way in which the work is done, um, typically driving towards productivity, driving to higher levels of service. And certainly healthcare is a, a very strong candidate. We already have a group in that area. Things such as smart energy, environmental monitoring, and so forth, transport, um, are also likely to be equally important. Um, and so quite a, a big focus of our, of our research agenda is starting to take more of that kind of vertical dimension. Um, and from working with colleagues in universities, working with colleagues in other companies, that's how we're hearing some of those use case scenarios. I think fundamentally Microsoft is a technology company. Um, and we will be bubbling up technologies and seeing which ones stick. Um, and with the ones that stick, we'll you know, run them as fast as we can. That is the nature of the company. And I think fundamentally, most of us in the company do believe that technology leads innovation. But the trick is to, as you see it, take off in an area to run with it very, very quickly and exploit it. These are, um, I also agree with these uh, comments. And these are examples of computing um, becoming more and more important and affecting more of uh, our lives in the background. Um, so the fastest part of uh, Microsoft's business right now uh, uh, are in the uh, enterprise and in the server spaces, um, which are things that consumers don't feel or touch or see. And in healthcare, in energy, even in the whole uh, initiative towards natural user interaction, the whole idea of a consumer operating a computer starts to become far less prevalent. And instead, computing is just all around you, uh, you know, at your service, uh, supporting the things uh, that either your job or business or, um, or that your, uh, your life needs. And so it seems to me that, that, that th there's just huge growth um, uh, opportunities there. Uh, and it seems that that will start to dominate uh, what Microsoft does, at least long term. Yes, just I, I think largely in agreement with the vertical picture that a Andrew and others are painting. Uh, when, when I was Dean of Engineering, uh, I came from the Electronics and Computer Science Department, and you know, I was trying to give a vision for engineering of the future to my civil engineering department, aeronautical engineering, ship science, uh, and all these traditional engineering disciplines. And they didn't really like my vision very much because really, um, uh, building is really going to be a smart distributed computing system. Similarly, uh, an airplane is a flying distributed computing system. Uh, and really, uh, ICT is going to be in everything, and software will be in everything. And I think Microsoft will find opportunities. You're already seeing uh, in uh, Microsoft has various deals with Ford, for example, with voice controls in, 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 uh, in cars, in the automotive industry. And I think that's just the beginning of these type of applications. Um, so, so Ursula Martin earlier today m mentioned uh, one of the dangers of, of the potential dangers of using technology and I was wondering if you think in 20 years time computer science and, and, and so the, the, I think that the speaker said well you know we, we shouldn't really worry too much about how the how the technology might be abused I wonder if in 20 years time we should be getting more involved in the in, 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 in talking about or discussing the ethical issues and the danger in which technology might be used because I think in the way, same way as doctors might talk about the ethical treatments and, and, and technologies that they develop, maybe we should also be debating and talking about and thinking about and taking it on board as, as one of the things that we should also be, be, be discussing with society. Yes, I, I think uh, I feel very strongly about this um, point. In fact, um, I was describing to the speaker after that um, that the um, uh, when I was at DARPA, I arrived at DARPA just after the Iranian elections in 2009, 
Um, and it became apparent that uh, the Iranian government was using uh, good technologies, technologies to help uh, detect intrusions into computer networks in order to hunt down and prosecute dissidents who were trying to access uh, sites like Twitter. And so you see that, um, that that was a new idea and that the computing community uh, failed to think about the potential misuses of technologies or just to assume blithely that, uh, that it was, this was, these were good technologies. And today in the computer security research community, uh, if you go to uh, you know, the Oakland Security Conference, there are some implicit assumptions that, for example, uh, eliminating an anonymity uh, on the internet will make the internet a safer place. Well, where we know there are repressive regimes uh, that would exploit those very same technologies to suppress freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And so I think as a community, the, we have a long way to go uh, to have a heightened sense of awareness and sensitivity to the, the potential bad uses of the things that we invent. Yeah, uh, just, just a quick comment. I think that uh, privacy and, and uh, ability to um, remove things from the web is going to be a real issue in the future. I think that many of my kids and, and their friends with their uh, recordings on Facebook will live to regret some of those. Uh, and actually removing things, forgetting things on the web is extremely difficult. There are now business opportunities in the US, there's a thing called Reputation Defender in the UK. My colleagues at Southampton have a startup company called Garlic, which actually finds out what, what's on the web about you and maybe you can do something about it. So uh, I think privacy, not only with respect to you know, medical records and things like that, but privacy that you want uh, is going to be a very complex issue. and. Uh, you can take the view as privacy is over, get over it, but I, I, I think most people will not wish to do that. So it's related to the security issues and, and tracking people down and all this sort of stuff. So complicated questions. I, I don't think any of us know the answer. I agree that there are no easy answers to these questions, but I think that the question behind the question was, should the research community engage in these, in these issues? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I mean, part of my role these days is to have some of those conversations. Um, a lot of it is groping together with the political community on understanding the issues. Um, and you, it may be the case that by the time um, Tony's kids are in the workplace, or certainly mine are a little bit younger, everyone has an embarrassing photograph on Facebook, so it's not an issue. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a very simplifying assumption that may not be the case. Um, when we talk about um, protecting people from the damage that um, the internet can do to them, one solution is to think of an analog with the way we protect the roads. Um, any can, anyone can walk on a sidewalk or a pavement in, in, in most countries, certainly in, in Europe. Um, if you want to get in a car, you have to apply to the state for a license because a car is a more dangerous thing. It's faster and you can wipe more people out in a car than you can as a pedestrian. And if you want to drive a big truck that moves lots of things around, you have to have even more licensing privileges and even more tests, and it may be you're audited every year um, to make sure that you know, you've maintained your, your level of skill. Um, you could imagine applying that to internet service providers and even internet users, but then you've established identity, and that has all the other associated risks, and, and Europe has sensitivities around the abuse of identity going back to the, the last century. So these are very difficult challenges. Um, we can just duck the question, um, but then I think the politicians will invent stupid rules that don't work. Um, I think if we get a discussion about the issues out in the open earlier, there at least can be informed debate and people can understand some of the risks. I think we are in the dilemma that many sciences are. Everything we produce has a good side and a, and a dark side. Um, let's be upfront about that. Let's talk about some of the, the ways in which um, we can mitigate the bad effects um, and some of the ways in which governments at a global scale have to think about regulation and codes of practice um, to make the world a safe place for technology. I don't think you can stop the, the pace of development, and so you, you've got to respond to these things and respond early rather than late. Great. Well, I think